watching the recording, you will be required to take a short quiz after this presentation as proof of participation. Everyone attending the live training today, your attendance is already being tracked through the webinar software, so no quiz will be required. During the live presentation, if you have questions, please enter them into the chat box. I will be compiling the questions after the training today, and I'll send out a Q&A email to all CACFP at-risk districts later this week. Those of you watching the recording, I will post the Q&As on the website, and if you have any questions after reviewing this training, please contact me at the email address on your screen. My name is Alyssa Mank. I'm a Child and Adult Care Food Program Nutrition Consultant for the Department of Education. I've worked in child nutrition for a little over eight years, and I specialize in the CACFP at risk in the pre-K program. Maine has a wonderful child nutrition team. Please feel free to reach out to any of the child nutrition staff with questions or, su or for support. Okay, let's get started. First, I will be discussing the legislation that was passed in 2019 called LD 577. Those of you watching the recording, if this legislation does not apply to your district or your district is an experienced CACFP sponsor, you may skip ahead in this presentation to the slide titled CACFP Meal Pattern. Those of you attending the live version today will get a quick refresher. So what is LD 577? LD 577 is titled an act to increase access to nutritious foods in schools by implementing an after school food program for at risk students. The public law is available to view online at the link on your screen. The law states beginning with the 2020 school year, a school administrative unit with at least one public school in which at least 50% of the students qualify for a free or reduced price lunch during the preceding school year shall participate in the federal child and adult care food program. How do I know if my school district meets the 50% or more criteria? In anticipation of this question, DOE Child Nutrition annually creates a report titled LD577 Report by District. This report shows all the schools and districts that fall under the requirements of LD577 for that school year. The LD 577 status report is located on the CACFP at risk webpage. The link to the at risk webpage is available on your screen. It is important to know that the image of the report on your screen is an old example of the report and is not current. Please check the full report to see if any of your school districts are listed. So what do we need to serve for CACFP at risk after school? The typical meals are snack, which is a two component snack, and supper, which is a five component meal. Supper can be in unitized containers or served through the normal lunch line. It can be hot or cold, and it's a great way to serve unused items from lunch. Schools can use offer versus serve. They offer five components and a student must take at least three, and it's $4.54 for each supper meal served. That's $4.25 in reimbursement, along with 29 cents of cash in lieu of commodities for each supper or lunch meal served. Reimbursements are updated every July and were released this past week or last couple weeks. The rates on your screen are effective July 1st through June 30th of the following year. Please reach out to me by email if you have any questions about the current reimbursement rates. Districts who operate CACFP at risk can serve on snow days, school vacations, and weekends. Districts can even serve breakfast or lunch on those days with prior approval. It's important to know that snack or supper can be served as soon as the school day ends. So for example, ABC school dismissal bell rings at 2.30 p.m. ABC school can serve supper at 2.30 p.m. A requirement of the program is that participants need to eat their meal on site. I will be discussing any waivers currently in place at the end of this presentation. If my district meets the requirements of the law for CACFP at risk after school, but our district is already serving snacks through the after school snack service program, do we need to do anything? And the answer is yes. The district needs to either participate in the CACFP at risk after school program or opt out using the guidance from LD 577. 
Another question we get is our district does not offer an after school enrichment activity. What are we required to do? An after school or education enrichment activity that is open to all is a requirement to participate in CACFP at risk after school. If a district or school does not provide education or enrichment activities, the district or school does not qualify for CACFP at risk and must opt out using the guidance from LD 577 or start an enrichment program. So what does open to all mean? Education or enrichment activities that do not limit membership for reasons other than space or security or where applicable licensing requirements. So this means that football or a basketball team or any sports teams would not qualify as enrichment because it's not open to everyone every day. Examples of open to all enrichment activities could be homework help groups, garden club, Lego club, etc. So how does my district opt out? By law, a school administrative unit that is required to operate the CACFP may choose to not operate such a program if it determines by a vote of the governing body of the school after notice and a public hearing that operating such a program would be financially or logistically impractical. So this could be a school board meeting which allows a public hearing prior to the vote. After our district holds the public hearing and the board votes, do I need to report the results to the Department of Education? And the answer is yes. An online LD 577 opt out form is created annually. This form requires information regarding the date of the notice, the date of the public hearing and the date and results of the school board vote. The form also asks why the sponsor or district decided not to operate the CACFP at risk program. Under LD 577, when do schools have to have their public hearing by? Is there a deadline or a timeline? Child Nutrition annually posts a list of qualifying schools that fall under LD 577 for that school year. The notice, the public hearing, and the school board vote needs to be completed sometime within that qualifying school year. So to recap, the qualifying district can start or opt out any time during the qualifying school year. So a district that may want to pilot the CACFP at risk program and serve supper may want to try to start the program in the spring. They can try it out for a few months and see how it goes. So what is the process for starting the program? The first is to reach out to child nutrition via email and let us know your district is interested in starting the program. You're required to watch the CACFP at risk webinar which if you're doing it now, congratulations, you can check that off your list. And the third is to send the CACFP team the required information to be set up in CNP web. You need to obtain a user ID and password for the CACFP team and complete a CACFP online agreement through CNP web. The last, when your agreement is approved, um, the district may claim meals from the beginning of the month in which the agreement is approved. The agreement process time can vary based on the number of corrections needed once it has been submitted to the state agency. The CACFP team is great about processing agreements as quickly as possible. If you have questions about what you just heard or you need clarification, we recognize each district and school is unique, so please reach out to us. We want to help. Now we're going to dig into the basics about CACFP at risk. Please know all CACFP training documents are located on our webpage or by using the link on your screen. All CACFP IRS training materials are sent out annually when your agreement is approved or when you complete your agreement renewal. First, we're going to talk about the CACFP meal pattern. At risk programs can operate regular school hours. This includes holidays, vacations, and snow days. At-risk sites can serve up to one meal and one snack per child per day. So for an example, as far as vacation, ABC School can serve breakfast and AM snack during school vacation weeks as long as that enrichment activity is offered. This is the CACFP meal pattern. In CACFP at risk, you can serve any child age 18 and younger. It's important to know that you would serve participants between the ages of 13 and 18, the same serving sizes as the 6 to 12 age group. 
These are minimum serving sizes. We certainly encourage your districts to serve more to the older kids as they may need more. Breakfast may be served on school vacations, weekends, and holidays if the education enrichment activity is offered. The breakfast meal pattern is made up of three food components. The first is fluid milk. The second is a fruit or a vegetable or a combination. At breakfast, fruits and vegetables are treated as a single component. So for breakfast, districts can choose to serve a vegetable, a fruit, or a combination of both. And the third component is a grain food. If you wish at breakfast, you may replace the grain component with a meat or meat alternate item up to three times per week. Parents may provide one nutritionally equivalent component per day, and the district can still claim the meal for reimbursement. An important thing to remember is there are no vegetable subgroup requirements in the CACFP. Districts can choose if they want to follow the CACFP meal pattern or if they want to stick with the NSLP meal pattern. The vegetable subgroups would be required for districts utilizing the NSLP meal pattern. CACFP meal pattern includes a flexibility to serve meat or meat alternates in a reimbursable breakfast. Schools may substitute the entire grain component with a meat alternate at breakfast a maximum of three times per week. And yogurt must contain no more than 23 grams of sugar per six ounces. This handout available on our webpage can provide you with more tips and information about replacing the grain with a meat or meat alternate item at breakfast. USDA has a great handout regarding serving milk in the CACFP. It has a lot of great information and there's a quick guide for serving milk to all ages in CACFP. On the back page, it gives you space to practice identifying the correct meal, milk for the different age groups. Very similar to NSLP, CACFP sites must provide reasonable modifications to meals and snacks or to the meal service itself to accommodate participants with disabilities. These modifications are done on a case by case basis. If the meal modification required does not meet the meal pattern requirements, then a medical statement from a licensed physician or a licensed health care professional who is authorized to write medical prescriptions under state law must be provided. Meals that do not meet the meal pattern requirements are not re are not eligible for reimbursement unless they are supported by the medical statement. The medical statement should include a description of the child's disability so that you understand how it restricts the child's diet. The statement should also describe what must be done to accommodate the disability. This may include what food should not be served and recommendations for what should be served. A medical statement is required to justify reimbursement for the modified meal. This statement should be kept on file at the site or where the food is prepared. If the parent provides a note signed by a doctor, then you must provide the substitution. You may always choose to accommodate a non-disability related special dietary need that is not supported by a medical statement. If the modif modification requested can be made within the meal pattern requirements. An example of this would be if a parent told you that their child cannot eat strawberries. Strawberries can be easily replaced by another fruit to meet the meal pattern requirements. Modified meals that meet the meal pattern requirements are reimbursable without a written medical statement. However, you should have a note from a parent on file so that we know why the child is receiving something different from everyone else and there is no appearance of any sort of discrimination. Non-dairy beverages may be served to participants with medical or other special dietary needs. Non-dairy products that do not meet eligibility requirements may only be claimed if there's a documented disability and the product is specifically listed on the diet modification form, which is signed by the medical authority. Non-dairy beverages must be nutritionally equivalent to the cow's milk and meet the nutritional standards listed in the manual. Non-dairy beverages may be any fat level and must be unflavored for children under six years of age. As you'll remember, fluid milk is its own component in the CACFP. So if you cannot serve fluid cow's milk, then you need to find another beverage that's nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk, or you need a note from a doctor if you want to receive reimbursement. The following milk substitutes do not require a diet modification form, lactose reduced milk like lactate, or non-dairy beverages that are nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk. 
Remember, if the parent or guardian has a doctor's note, then you must provide the food substitute. However, you may run into a situation where a parent or guardian requests a substitute, but the child does not have a disability and they do not have a note from the doctor. It's definitely great customer service to provide the requested substitute if at all possible. If not, remember that parents can still bring in one food component and you can still claim the meal if you provide all the other food. Regardless of whether you're providing the substitute or the parents are, have the parent fill out the diet modification form and keep it on file to prevent any appearance of discrimination. The meal containing the substitute will be reimbursable if the substitute is nutritionally equivalent to the original component and meets the meal pattern requirements and the diet modification form is on file. So for example, a family might be vegetarian and want their child to receive a non-dairy beverage. It would be great customer service to purchase the non-dairy beverage if you can. Have the family fill out the diet modification form to request that their child receive a non-dairy beverage. Then refer to the list of milk substitutes mentioned in the last slide. If the non-dairy beverage on the slide that they requested is listed on the chart. It is nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk, so it meets the meal pattern requirements, and you can serve and receive reimbursement with just the parent note on file. If the parents insist on a non-dairy beverage that is not listed and it is not nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk, you cannot receive reimbursement for the meals and snacks containing the substitute until you get a note from the doctor. 100% fruit or vegetable juice is creditable in the CACFP as either a fruit or a vegetable, depending on what it's made of, but you are only allowed to serve juice one time per day. This is due to juice lacking dietary fiber and other nutrients. Vegetables and fruits that are blended and served as a smoothie are considered to be juice and are included in the restriction of juice being served no more than once each day. The once per day juice restriction applies to the site, not to the individual child or adult. So juice cannot be served at PM snack and supper, even if the snacks are being served to two distinctly different groups of children. If juice is being served at two different supper shifts to two distinctly different groups of children, it can be served to both shifts because only one meal service contains the juice. The meal pattern for kids for lunch and supper is made up of all five food components. Unlike breakfast, fruits and vegetables are considered different food, comp food components at lunch. There are a few rules around serving fruits and veggies at meal times. Pureed fruits and vegetables used as part of a meal, so an example could be carrots and a sauce used for macaroni and cheese, can count as a credible vegetable as long as the dish also contains at least an eighth of a cup of a recognizable vegetable per serving. Two servings of different beans, peas, or legumes can count as a vegetable and as a meat alternate in the same meal if they are in separate dishes. For example, chickpeas may be served as part of a salad as a vegetable component, and pinto beans may be served as part of a chili as a meat alternate component. A full serving of the legumes included in each dish must be served to each child in order to claim both a vegetable and a meat alternate component. At lunch and supper, you have the flexibility to replace the fruit component with a second vegetable if it's a different vegetable from the one you've already going to serve. This is because most children already eat enough fruit. Allowing two vegetables at lunch and supper increases exposure to a wider variety of vegetables. Vegetables do credit towards the meal pattern based on volume. In kind of opposite of dried fruit, raw leafy vegetables credit at half the volume. So for example, one cup of raw spinach leaves would credit as a half a cup of vegetables. And in the CACFP, we credit tomatoes and avocados as vegetables. So keep that in mind when you plan your menus. Here's an example. The lunch and supper meal pattern for six children six to 18 years of age requires the minimum serving size of a half a cup of vegetables and a quarter cup of fruit. Therefore, the serving size of the second vegetable served in place of the fruit component at lunch or supper for this age group must be at least a quarter of a cup. And remember to offer two different vegetables. If you offered a half a cup of cooked carrots and a quarter cup of raw baby carrots, then the meal would not meet the meal pattern and you would not receive reimbursement for the meal. 
So in the example above, a supper with a serving of red peppers and a serving of carrots, both of which are in the red and orange vegetable subgroup would be allowable. Schools may not serve two fruits at lunch and supper. Food items that are a mix of vegetables and fruit, such as a carrot, raisin, salad, can credit towards both the vegetable and fruit component at lunch and supper if each component is easily recognizable and each serving size contains at least the minimum reimbursable serving size of an eighth of a cup of carrots and an eighth of a cup of raisins. A child in the 6 to 12 year age group would need a half a cup of carrots and an eighth of a cup of raisins which is a dried fruit in a serving to have the carrot raisin salad credit as the entire vegetable and the entire fruit component. Now you may have noticed that I said an eighth, of, an eighth of a cup of raisins rather than a quarter cup of fruit mentioned in the meal pattern, and that's because dried fruit credits a little differently. Dried fruits credit towards the meal pattern at twice the volume of fresh fruit. So a quarter cup of dried raisins credits as a half a cup of fruit. Another rule around serving fruits is that home canned fruits are not allowed due to the risk of botulism, but freezing your own fruit is okay. Just like vegetables and fruit mixtures, serving two vegetables as part of a vegetable mixture can also credit towards the entire fruit and vegetable component if you can recognize each vegetable and each serving contains at least the minimum eighth of a cup serving size. Also to note, home canned vegetables are not allowed, again, due to the risk of botulism, but like fruits, freezing your own vegetables is okay. If you buy pre-mixed veggie mixtures like the one on your screen, they'll need to credit as a single vegetable because you don't know how much of each vegetable is actually in the mixture. At snack time, you can serve two of the five components as long as one of the components is a beverage. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. At snack time, you can serve any two of the five components as long as only one of the components is a beverage. It is best practice to include a fruit or vegetable as one of your snack components to encourage healthy eating. So basically, if you're serving a snack, you can't have two um, liquids. You couldn't serve juice as a fruit and have them also have milk because then that would be a liquid snack. So they want the children to eat something along with a drink if that's what you're choosing to offer. The green component includes foods like breads, cereals, crackers, rolls, muffins, and tortillas. Major things that you need to remember about grains in CACFP include that most wheat and grains are not allowed in CACFP and that one grain item served each day must be whole grain rich. For grains are for grains, they are now measured in ounce equivalents. Schools have been measuring grains in ounce equivalents for years, and now it's the same across all child nutrition programs, which is exciting. On the CACFP resources webpage, we have a section dedicated specifically to ounce equivalents resources, including measuring the measuring chart, the feeding infants using ounce equivalents guide, calculating ounce equivalents and recipes, and crediting single serving packages of grains. My amazing coworker April has created and recorded a wonderful ounce equivalents webinar that takes you step by step through the process of determining ounce equivalents in CACFP. This webinar link is available on our resources webpage, and I also put the link on this slide. Let's move on to grain based desserts. Grain-based desserts include all grain products that contain sugar, with the exception of quick breads and muffins. So for example, banana bread, pumpkin mu muffins, graham crackers, and animal crackers are okay. Common grain-based desserts are granola bars, cinnamon rolls, whole grain donuts, or any type of cereal or fruit bar. These items are not allowable in CACFP and should not be served as part of the meal pattern. It is also important to know that CACFP reimbursement cannot be used to purchase grain-based desserts. USDA has created this great list that break down, breaks down what is a grain-based dessert and what is not a grain-based dessert. This is a great visual reminder for your kitchen staff. With CACFP, one grain component served per day must be whole grain rich. If you plan to serve only one meal or snack, 
per day in your program, the grain served at that meal must be whole grain rich. On this slide is a resource created by the National CACFP Sponsors Association that we have available on our webpage. This handout shows you how to correctly identify a whole grain rich food item using all the rules, but including the rule of three and other methods. This resource is available on our webpage. In CACFP, you are required to post a dated menu for parents and children to see the wonderful food that you're serving. Production records are not required for CACFP, so your menu must state all the components that you're offering specifically. Generic statements like fruit or vegetable should be updated to the actual item offered before the day of the meal service. Cereals and yogurt should specifically list the types served since there are sugar limits on those items in CACFP. The types of milk offered should be clearly represented on the menu. Here you can see the district is offering 1% white or skim chocolate milk with each meal. Another menu requirement is that you identify which daily item is whole grain or whole grain rich. You cannot write a statement on the menu that says one grain served per day is whole grain rich. You actually need to identify specific items each day with the words whole grain or the letters WG or WGR. The posted menu should also include the short non-discrimination statement, which is this institution is an equal opportunity provider. Please be aware potato chips and veggie straws are not creditable items in the food program. Breakfast cereals served must contain no more than six grams of sugar per dry ounce. Breakfast cereals include ready to eat cereals and instant and hot cereals. So how do I determine if, bre if my breakfast cereal is within the sugar limits? You can use the main WIC approved breakfast cereal list. Any cereal within this list meets the sugar limits. The second way is to use USDA's team nutrition training worksheet. It has a nutrition label and a chart. You look at the nutrition label of your product and you compare it to the chart on your screen and it will help you to determine if your cereal meets the sugar limits. The third is to do the calculation yourself. Again, the worksheet will help you determine if your cereal meets the sugar limits. You look at your nutrition facts label, you divide the grams of sugar by the serving size, and if your calculation is 0.212 or less, then the cereal meets the sugar limits for breakfast cereals in the CACFP. Likewise, how do I determine if a yogurt is within the sugar limit? Again, you can use the USDA's team new training team nutrition training worksheet, which is very similar. You look at the label, compare it to the chart, and you'll see if your item beats the sugar limits. The second way is very similar to the one we saw with cereal where you're doing the calculation yourself. At-risk sites um, can do offer versus serve. They must offer all five components at supper and a child may decline to take one or two of those components. Mixed component items containing three or more components may not be declined. A food component is one of the food groups that comprise a reimbursable meal. A food item is a specific food offered within a food component. So turkey on whole grain bread is a food item that contains two food components. It's important to know that offer versus serve is not allowed for snacks. USDA has this great handout available for more information on how to implement offer versus serve. There may be times when you want to serve a homemade or pre-made combination food or a mixed dish. These are foods in which a single serving of the food item contains two or more of the required components. Common examples of combination foods are pizza, shepherd's pie, chef salads, and hamburger on a bun with lettuce and tomato. To document how these foods credit towards the meal pattern, keep either a standardized recipe or documentation from the food manufacturer on file. We will ask to see these documents during administrative reviews. A CN label statement clearly identifies 
is the contribution of a product towards the meal pattern requirements. It protects child nutrition program operators from exaggerated claims about a product. A CN label provides a warranty against audit claims if the CN label product is used according to the manufacturer's directions. During an administrative review, the CACFP team will be asking to see copies of CN labels for items listed on the menus. There are a couple of great resources available for helping you determine if, if and how a food item credits towards the meal pattern. One of these items is the USDA Food Buying Guide. The Food Buying Guide is available online and includes many different features to help you determine if items are creditable and help you determine how much food to purchase. They also have a Food Buying Guide app now. Another resource is USDA's newly updated crediting handbook for the CACFP. This is a great resource for learning about the meal pattern and determining if foods are creditable or not. I think this is really handy for um, school districts to save on their computer. Um, I use this almost daily. When I need to search for something, I do the control F function. I search what I'm looking for and I can find out anything that I need about that certain item. So if I wanted to look up hot dogs, I could do the search function. I could figure out what is creditable. I say that this is helpful for school districts because there may be differences between NSLP and CACFP and it's important to know the difference. Now I'm going to talk about record keeping in the CACFP. Record keeping is a very significant part of the CACFP. Keeping accurate, complete CACFP records proves that you're eligible to receive the reimbursement. You'll hear us say a lot, if we can't see proof, we have to say it didn't happen. There are a lot of different types of records that you need to keep for CACFP. Today I'm going to go over what records you need to keep on file and where. Please try to keep your records well organized. It will save all of us time and energy when we review your program. You can keep your records digitally or on paper. CACFP reviewers are all back in the office this school year. We will be doing hybrid review models. We ask for documents to be uploaded in the e-review system ahead of time, and we will be looking at other documents while we're on site. According to regulations, you must keep all CACFP records for three years plus the current year, so four years total. If your institution is going through an audit, certainly keep your records until that audit is closed. If your institution has a policy to keep them longer, of course, that's fine as well. The current and past year's documentation must be kept on site, and the other two years can be kept off site if you don't have enough space to keep all four years on site. We give you all different records and forms and information that you'll need for your daily CACFP operations. CACFP sends out an at-risk documentation once your agreement is approved or renewed. Most of the resources are also at the very top of the resources page of our DOE CACFP website, so you can access them anytime that you need them. If the forms that we created for daily operation do not work well for your particular program, you are welcome to create your own as long as they capture all the information needed. It will be helpful if you organize the majority of your program paperwork by month. When we audit your program, we will request to see all of your program paperwork for a specific month of operation. So having it already organized by month is really helpful. Most school districts are now familiar with CNP web. When you participate in CACFP, you are required to com complete an agreement in CNP web. This is an example of a CACFP agreement. In an effort to streamline the pro application process for school districts, school districts are not required to complete the budget or the management plan portion of the agreement. The online agreement tells the state how and where your district plans to operate the CACFP at risk program. We consider the agreement in CNP web a living document because you can make changes to it throughout the year with state agency approval. It is a great reference to make sure that you're claiming the correct number of sites and participants and the correct type of meals. Once you've completed one online agreement in CNP web, the majority of the information will roll over into the following year. The district will be required to submit an agreement every year. Now I'm going to go through some of the specific record keeping requirements for different CACFP records. The first is the non-discrimination statement. 
The non-discrimination statement is required on all program materials that are distributed to the public that discuss USDA or CACFP. USDA is very particular about the non-discrimination statement. You must use the exact wording of the statement and be careful about font size. There are two non-discrimination statements, the full one and the short one. This is the full non-discrimination statement. As you can see, it's pretty long and it works well in bigger publications like the program handbook or the school handbook. This is the short statement. Prior approval for using the short statement is required for everything except for menus. You can use the short statement on menus without permission. Mentioning USDA or CACFP specific um, means that you really need to use the non-discrimination statement. If you are offering the CACFP, um, you need to make sure that you're mentioning it on the non-discrimination statement or linking the large the linking the large non-discrimination statement from our website to your website or social media. There are different record keeping requirements for different types of documentation. These are records that must be made available for public view. We will check when we review your program. I'm excited to share that the building for the future flyer is no longer a required posting for CACFP at risk sites, but you are still required to post a current dated menu and the injustice for all poster, which is provided by DOE. These are examples of unitized meals from Portland Public Schools. There's a chicken Caesar salad, make your own pizza and a cracker stacker. Portland uses a CACFP meal pattern because the serving sizes are smaller and they can fit it in unitized containers. Sanford Schools has utilized their mascot to brand their supper meals and have named them Spartan Super Snacks. They have created stickers that go on the unitized meal containers to show off their brand, along with posting the menu in public view. The Spartan Super Snack menu is posted daily in the announcements, and it's a great way to promote your program during the school year. Meals are delivered to sites in Cambro containers to keep meals at the correct temperatures. For This is at Portland Public Schools. At-risk meal services are different for every school in every district. Some use carts, some use the normal lunch line. You need to find a way that works best for your students and your staff. The meal service can be in the cafeteria or served from a cart. The kids can eat in the cafeteria, the classroom, or on the sports field in the library, anywhere on site. Under typical program rules, participants can only take one component off site, a grain, a fruit, or a vegetable. Um, it, the supper cart in the picture is from a school district in um, LA, and they have um, a cart service. In order to participate in CACFP, you are required to train your CACFP on seven specific CACFP topics annually. Trainings that you or your staff receive outside of your organization do not count towards this requirement. You need to train your staff on exactly how to perform CACFP duties in your program, so outside trainings don't count. Some topics relate to all staff, while some topics only relate to staff with relevant duties. You are required to keep documentation of these trainings. We can't just take your word for it. Again, you'll hear us say if we can't see it, we have to say it that it didn't happen. We do have a form available to help you track staff training. This is available on the checklist tab in CNP web. It is also listed on our web page. The form lists all of the required training topics and it has places to record the date and the location of the training as well as the place for the trainer and the attendees to sign in. Need to train on topics related to the staff members duties. So you wouldn't need to train someone on how to take point of service meal counts if they only file the claim. If you're working with an outside entity to provide enrichment after school and they are the individuals responsible for meal counts and attendance, then they need training as well. It may be in the district's best interest to have site staff responsible for these duties, sign a statement that they understand the training and requirements of the CACFP program. 
There are seven required topics that you must train your staff on. When we review your program, we'll ask to see your training documentation for all of the seven required topics for all applicable staff. Civil rights is the first required training topic. Everyone having anything to do with CACFP needs civil rights training. We do have a civil rights presentation on our website that you can use for your in-house civil rights training because civil rights procedures are the same for everyone. This is the only outside training that you can use for your in-house trainings. These are the other six required training topics. Please remember I'm talking about in-house training, not trainings you receive from us at the state or anywhere else. For each of these six topics, you will annually train staff with related duties on how you meet these program requirements within your organization. You will train your staff on your organization's procedures for meeting these requirements. We can't help you with these trainings because we don't know exactly how you do these things in your organization. For example, in some programs, point of service meal counts are taken by teachers. In other programs, the cook may be in charge of point of service meal counts. Every program in our state is a little bit different, so you need to train your staff on your specific procedures. We touched on it briefly earlier, but it's imperative that you keep any doctor's notes or parent requests on file regarding food substitutions. If you have a specific food substitution form through the school and NSLP, that is fine to keep um, as a CACFP record. If the food substitution results in you not meeting the meal pattern, you must have a doctor's note on file if you plan to claim the meal or snack. If it's a parent request, you can still meet the meal pattern with the food being substituted by keeping these notes prevents any appearance of discrimination if a child is not eating the same food as everyone else. Again, we'll ask about these notes when we review your program, and if you have the notes through NSLP, that's totally fine. We'll look at those forms as well. You also need to keep point of service meal count records. Point of service means that you're taking these counts of meals served immediately before, during, or immediately after the meal service. Most CACFP programs require meal counts to be taken per child at point of service. Some programs have a sheet of paper with a list of kids' names and columns for each meal and snack. They make a check mark next to each child's name when they've served them as a meal or snack. We included a sample meal count form. Um, on the list of resources we mentioned earlier. You're welcome to check that out um, and use the meal count form or you can create your own as long as it captures all the needed information. Some businesses purchase computer software that captures their meal counts. Either methods acceptable. At risk after school programs may take consolidated meal counts, which are just the total number of meal counts served rather than doing it by child's name. Attendance records are another CACFP requirement. Attendance must capture the individual's first and last name. And just to be clear, this is attendance at the meal, not attendance at the enrichment program. Meal count should never be higher than attendance, so attendance records make a great edit check to ensure that you're not claiming, you're not over claiming meals or snacks. Um, you should build in an edit check when compiling meal counts and attendance for the claim. USDA likes to see two sets of eyes on all program paperwork to ensure accuracy whenever possible. We've also known, noticed a lot in the last two years that there has been a lot of staff turnover, so having two people trained in all aspects of CACFP duties is extremely beneficial. Some districts are using their point of service keypad system as an attendance tracker as it links to a child's name and a tick sheet similar to the ones in summer for the meal count. All districts currently operating the program do it differently. Make sure you do what works best for your school. Accountability is key. Districts cannot claim more meals than participants in attendance. We say that, but CNP Web will not let you claim more than kids you have in an attendance. So make sure that you have attendance tracked accurately. This is something needs to be discussed when partnering with outside organizations. The district is responsible if numbers are not correct. 
This is the meal count form example that's available on our website. It gives a space for a participant to write their first and last name, a check mark for attendance, and a check mark for our meal. Again, all at risk sites meet these requirements differently to so do what best works best for your school. Monitoring and five day reconciliations are required for institutions with more than one site, and they help ensure program integrity. This form is available on our website, but we also send it out annually to at-risk sites upon the agreement or approval renewal. The district is required to review each of their sites three times per year. Two of the three visits must be unannounced. At least one announced visit, unannounced visit must be include the. I'm sorry, at least one unannounced visit must include the meal service observation and new sites must be monitored within the first four weeks of operation. Then we provide monitoring forms for you, which outline everything you need to observe and record. Other things you need to know about mon monitoring multiple sites, the amount of time between visits cannot exceed six months. Timing of unannounced visits must vary so that they are not predictable. You need to make sure to vary meal services observed, and if you're serving suppers, evening snack, or weekend meals, make sure to observe those as well. A five-day reconciliation form must be completed at each monitoring visit. The purpose is to reconcile meal counts to attendance, um, and it helps to determine if meal counts are reasonable. It highlights any discrepancies in meal counts and attendance, and it ensures that you're within your license capacity or your building capacity is being followed. This process allows us to look at a week's worth of attendance and meal counts to make sure things look okay. Um, this document is also available on our web page. USDA has issued the attached Q&A memo to answer questions regarding the annual collection of race and ethnicity data. Although CACFP institutions are no longer allowed to make visual observation by race and ethnicity, the data must still be collected each year. Districts that collect meal benefit applications should make every effort to help parents understand the reason for the data collection and encourage them to complete the race and ethnicity portions of the form. The attached memo provides some links to school data and census data websites, which institutions that do not collect race and ethnicity data through meal benefit applications can use to collect the data for the area in which their sites are located. Those districts should utilize the links to collect this data every year, unless you are already collecting the data at each site. USDA expects institutions that collect the data for other purposes or programs to gather the data from those programs and keep it in their CACFP files. The memo specifies that USDA encourages institutions that do not collect enrollment forms to ask parents to verbally identify the race and ethnicity of their children, and that USDA discourages asking children to self identify. Please make sure you take the time to read the memo. It's posted on our web page. USDA expects a specific conversation to take place if the institution asks parents to identify the race and ethnicity of their children. If parents rarely come into the site or if the conversation is uncomfortable, please use the data that can be found through the provided links for school and our census data. If an institution uses the data found on the school's data or census websites, please be sure to print or otherwise document that the data that data and keep it in your CACFP files. Schools that sponsor at-risk sites can use the race and ethnicity data that is collected for the school in which the at-risk program is operating. When filing a claim through CNP Web, it's important to remember that each claim applies to a single calendar month. So for example, February would be February 1st to February 28th, even if that month ends in the middle of the week. Make sure your other supporting documents reflect that as well. At-risk after-school programs receive the free rate of reimbursement for all meals and snacks served. Cash in lieu, I mean CIL stands for cash in lieu. This is extra reimbursement money that you will receive for every lunch and supper served that meets the meal pattern. So for every free lunch, 
and supper you serve, you'll get $4.54 in reimbursement. This is a screenshot of a site claim for a for-profit child care center in our online claiming system. We've had a lot of folks tell us that they really like the claiming system. Um, and this is information that you'll be entering each month for your sites. At-risk programs enter the number of kids that participated in the month in the free section as they get the free rate for all participants. You'll enter the number of days you operated. That's the number of days that you were open for enrichment and fed kids at least one meal or snack through CACFP. The third, you'll enter your total monthly attendance, which I'll explain in the next slide. And next, you'll enter your total meal counts for the month. There are a couple more steps involved in submitting your claim for payment, but we have directions for filing claims in the new system and are here for assistance when you need it. As I mentioned, you will be required to report your total monthly attendance in our online claiming system. This is how you calculate your total monthly attendance. At the end of each day, you'll count the number of unique kids that attended your site using the attendance roster. At the end of the month, you'll add up all of the daily totals to calculate, or calculate your total monthly attendance. The payment system has edit checks in place to ensure that you it's paying you based on what you're approved for in your agreement. If you try to claim more than what's in your approved agreement, the system will give you an error message and the system will not pay a claim that has errors. When you claim, you cannot claim more kids than you've reported as being enrolled in your program. Since you are an open site, this is the best guess you made regarding your max amount of kids you could serve at one time. If your program has potential to serve more kids than your best guess, say there is an event happening at the school during the same time as your CACFP at risk supper, make sure you increase the amount for the month you plan to serve those additional kids. Also, you cannot claim for any meals or snacks that you're not approved to serve, and you can't claim for any months that you said you'd be closed. That's why it's so important to make sure that the info in your agreement is always current and correct. Also, if you go in to update your agreement, the system also looks at your sanitation and fire inspection dates and will not allow me to approve the agreement if those dates have expired. We have been working around that process due to delays because of COVID, but please make sure your agreement is updated with any changes. Please know when you make any change to your agreement, such as you increase the number of kids enrolled, we need to approve that change before you'll be able to file a claim for that change in the system. We can reimburse the district for changes in the month that you report the change and going forward, but we cannot reimburse the district for changes in the past. For example, let's say you revise your agreement on February 8th to increase your enrollment from 100 kids to 110, and we approve the increase on February 9th. I can process your February claim for up to 110 kids, but I couldn't process your January claim or any month prior to February with 110 kids, only 100 because only the hundred because kids that were that's the amount of kids that were approved to serve in January and before that. Claims must be entered into the system and must be in pending approval status on or before the 60 days after the last day of the claim month. So example, November's claim must be submitted on or before January 29th. The system does not display the claim due dates for you, or it, it does, I'm sorry. The system does display the claim due dates for you, so you'll always know when claims are due. Um, institutions are only allowed a one in three year exception every three years, so you're only allowed to make a mistake once every three years. Um, Submission of claims past the 60 day deadline are only allowed with prior approval from the state agency and require that you write a corrective action plan, which you'll implement to prevent future late claims. Can the CACFP at risk after school program continue to operate in summer after schools close for summer vacation? So, for example, if a school officially ends school year 22 20 and 23 on May 31st, can the school continue to operate CACFP at risk until June 30th, 2023? And the answer is no. Experienced sponsors are already aware that under federal regulations, CACFP and the Summer Food Service Program cannot operate at the same time. 
whenever your school year ends, so must see ACFP. Schools are encouraged to transition into the summer food service program during the summer, and CACFP at risk can pick back up again when school starts in the fall. That is the long non-discrimination statement that I'm required to show you at the end of a training. Thank you all for attending the training today. Those attending the live version, you will receive certificates of attendance via email in the next couple weeks. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I will send out a follow up email later this week. And as always, please don't hesitate to reach out to our office directly with any questions. Those of you watching the recorded version of this presentation should go back to the CACFP at risk webpage and complete the at risk 101 quiz. This tracks your participation for this annual training. No certificates will be sent out to those watching the recording. Please document your time and attendance after viewing this, tra this training and keep that documentation in your CACFP files. As a reminder, attending this training does not meet the requirement for your in-house training. You are required to train your district staff on the seven required training topics. Thank you for coming today and I hope you have a wonderful day.